Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 50, Apollo Program Flight 11, Apollo 17, Part 1, Light Up the Night. Last time, we covered the surface operations of Apollo 16. The first landing mission to the Lunar Highlands had hoped to confirm the hypothesis that the Descartes formation had been created by volcanic forces. When they got there, they found this to not be the case. But while the scientists may have been disappointed that their theory was wrong, they were surely delighted by the trove of data and samples returned from the moon by John Young and Charlie Duke. Except for the guy who ran the heat flow experiment. He was probably pretty bummed out. With Apollo 16 in the books, there was just one more lunar landing mission left. Apollo 17. The last lunar landing. Now, before you can say it, yes, I know. It's obviously not really the last landing mission. Someday, someone will go back to kick up some lunar dust. But at the time of this recording, in February 2018, Apollo 17 was the last time humans set foot on another world. And depending on what Elon Musk gets into his breakfast cereal, it seems unlikely that we'll be going back to the moon anytime soon. So that's just what I'm going to call it. Apollo 17. The last moon landing. With that in mind, competition was tight for the final three moon-bound seats. Who would be on the crew? This is a little convoluted, but I think it's also pretty interesting, so bear with me for a minute here. If we just go by Deke Slayton's usual policy of a backup crew rotating up to Prime after three missions, then we would expect the backup crew of Apollo 14 to get the nod. But we're actually going to take it one step further and see how the backup crew came to be chosen. Typically, a prime crew would fly a mission, warm the bench for two missions, and then cycle back in as a backup crew. With that in mind, the prime crew of Apollo 11, our old friends Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, would have gotten the slot. But all three men had retired from NASA by 1971, the year that Apollo 14 flew. Deke Slayton had actually offered Michael Collins the role of backup commander on Apollo 14, which would have put him in place to command Apollo 17. But Collins had already decided to retire if Apollo 11 was a success. The job was just too all-consuming. Collins thus joins my surprisingly long list of people who have turned down a chance to walk on the moon. Also on that list was a man who turned down the role of backup lunar module pilot on Apollo 13, Gene Cernan. Cernan had flown previously as pilot on Gemini 9A and as LMP on Apollo 10, flying to within just a few miles of the lunar surface. The backup role on Apollo 13 was essentially a chance to walk on the moon on Apollo 16, but Cernan said no. He had been the junior pilot for both of his space flights and he wanted a command. Not out of any desire to be barking orders, but simply to see if he had what it took. So he rolled the dice and hoped that he would be able to get a command role on a later mission. When Collins turned down the backup role of Apollo 14, it was Cernan's lucky day and he got the slot. Joining him on the backup crew was backup command module pilot Ron Evans and backup lunar module pilot Joe Engel. Around this time, Apollo 18 and 19 were still on the books. Though they would eventually be cancelled due to budget pressure, they weren't cancelled yet and astronauts already had their eyes on them, so the backup crew of Apollo 15 was a pretty desirable position. Of the Apollo 12 crew members, only command module pilot Dick Gordon was still in the rotation, since Commander Pete Conrad and LMP Alan Bean had moved on to the upcoming Skylab missions. So Gordon got the role of backup commander on Apollo 15. Joining him as command module pilot would be Vance Brand, and alongside him on the lunar descent would be Harrison Jack Schmidt. Schmidt was an interesting choice since he was the first of the scientist astronauts to be named to a backup crew, and thus essentially promised a chance to fly. In the mid-60s, NASA had been under increasing pressure to accept some scientists into the astronaut program. The existing astronauts were world-class pilots, but just didn't have the background and skill set to perform the kind of unique science that could be done in space. Sure, they were running experiments for ground-based scientists, but it just wasn't the same. Bowing to pressure, NASA accepted five scientists in 1965 and got to work turning them into astronauts. The divide between pilot astronaut and scientist astronaut was apparent right off the bat. The pilot astronauts did not like the scientist astronauts. 
They saw them as unwelcome intruders who would take the spot of quote-unquote real astronauts at best and get them killed at worst. They quickly fell to the back of the pecking order. Jack Schmidt was not deterred and took to his work at NASA with a sort of fanatical zeal. He managed to walk the line between the science world and the pilot world and became a useful representative to both sides without alienating either. Over time, he came to be respected as, if not a world-class pilot, then certainly an adequate one. He also played a role in getting the pilot astronauts interested in geology. Rather than dry classroom lessons, he got them into the field and connected them with fascinating geologists like Lee Silver and Farouk Albaz. And playing the role of communicator, he helped scientists understand when their experiment demands were just flat-out unrealistic in an actual mission. As the number of available surface missions dwindled, NASA management knew it would be madness to end the lunar program without flying a scientist to the moon. And by proving himself over the years, and by being the only geologist, Schmidt earned his spot on the backup crew of Apollo 15. The reason I'm telling you all of this is because, as we now know, Apollo 18 was eventually cancelled. This was obviously devastating to Gordon, Brand, and Schmidt. The official crew of Apollo 18 had not yet been named, but with the three-flight rotation, they thought they had it locked up. But there was still a glimmer of hope. The Apollo 17 crew also had yet to be named. It just made too much sense for NASA to fly a geologist. They could not not do it. And Gordon had Schmidt. So with a little lobbying of Deke Slayton and a little luck, maybe the Apollo 18 crew could move up a mission and take Apollo 17. In the end, the logic of sending a geologist to the moon did hold, but not in the way that Dick Gordon or Vance Brand had hoped. When the crew of Apollo 17 was announced, it would be Commander Gene Cernan, Command Module Pilot Ron Evans, and Lunar Module Pilot Harrison Schmidt. Joe Engel, who Slayton viewed as a little lax in his training, was bumped out and Harrison Schmidt was bumped up. Various appeals to Slayton were made, Cernan trying to save Engel's slot and Schmidt trying to bring Gordon and Brand, but the decision had been made. So now that we know our crew, let's do our usual look at their background. Flying as commander, we already know Gene Cernan quite well. He flew on Gemini 9A, where we discovered that EVA was actually pretty difficult, and then on Apollo 10, where he came within spitting distance of the moon. He rolled the dice, turning down a chance to walk on the moon on Apollo 16, and now here he is, commanding Apollo 17. This was his third and final flight. Flying as command module pilot would be Ron Evans. Ronald Evans was born on November 10, 1933, in St. Francis, Kansas. Evans attended the University of Kansas and received a degree in electrical engineering in 1956. While in school, he was part of the Navy ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps, and began flying for the Navy in 1957. During that time, he was a fighter pilot and command flight instructor, serving on aircraft carriers. Starting in 1964, he flew the F-8 Crusader off of the USS Ticonderoga, flying combat runs as part of the Vietnam War. And that's where NASA found him in 1966 when they scooped him up in Astronaut Group 5. This was his first and only flight. And last but not least, flying as Lunar Module Pilot was Harrison Jack Schmidt. Harrison Schmidt was born on July 3, 1935 in Santa Rita, New Mexico. And as you may expect from the first scientist astronaut to fly... His bio is a little bit different from the test pilot trope we've seen so frequently here. He attended the California Institute of Technology, where he received a degree in geology in 1957. He then spent some time romping around Norway and studying the geology there, which became the basis for the PhD he earned in 1964. Shortly after that, he joined a team in the fledgling field of astrogeology, led by legendary astrogeologist Gene Shoemaker, And when I say legendary astrogeologist, I mean he basically invented the field. Well, at least the geology part. Shoemaker had hoped to become an astronaut himself, but was grounded by a medical condition. But when NASA announced that they were looking for scientists to apply to be astronauts, he lobbied hard for Schmidt. If he couldn't go, at least one of his guys could go. Schmidt joined as one of five scientist astronauts in 1965. 
As discussed earlier, Schmidt worked his tail off to prove himself to the pilot astronauts, learning how to fly, facilitating communication between scientists and astronauts, and scrounging as much time in simulators and training as he could get. This was his first and only spaceflight. Alright, after a little more work than usual, we have our crew. But where are we going to send them? Some of the scientists involved, Schmidt among them, lobbied to send this final mission to the Tsiolkovsky Crater. The crater was named after one of the fathers of modern rocketry, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who you can learn more about all the way back in episode 2. The site was highly desirable as a landing spot because it was unlike previous landing environments and was unusual for having a large, dark, flat floor. I know what you're thinking. What are you talking about? The moon is covered in giant craters with large, dark, flat floors. Ah, but you're thinking of the front of the moon, and Tsiolkovsky is on the back. The proposed plan was pretty daring and would necessitate parking a couple of communication satellites out at the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrangian point. But NASA management was nervous. The end was in sight, and they were already moving on to other things. Why would they want to take such a big risk and potentially mar the entire program with a disaster? Tsiolkovsky was out. Instead, Apollo 17 would be headed to an area that had gained some interest based on orbital observations on Apollo 15, Taurus Littrow. So called because it was in the midst of the Taurus Mountains and near the large Littrow crater. This was a complicated and fascinating area that had the potential to answer a lot of questions in one fell swoop. For one thing, it was in the Lunar Highlands, so it would provide another data point from what was learned on Apollo 16. Taurus Littrow promised a diversity of data from the mountains, the plains, and of course, numerous craters. Plus, orbital photos showed what looked like landslides down the mountains, which could be really convenient. By taking samples from the landslides, they would essentially be taking samples of a whole swath of the mountain. And on top of all that, the entire site was blanketed in dust and what appeared to be cinder cones. This was the type of lure that geologists just can't resist. Potential evidence of geologically recent volcanic activity. It was not an easy landing site, though. Two large parts of the mountain range, the North and South Massifs, bracketed the landing site. In fact, the landing ellipse, which represents the area the LEM is likely to actually land in once uncertainty in the trajectory is factored in, had to be shrunk slightly in order to fit. They figured that by this time they were getting pretty good at this, so the smaller ellipse should be no problem. I've commented on this before, but it's really impressive to me how in just a few flights we've gone from landing miles off target in a giant plane to swooping between mountains and landing a few hundred feet from the target right next to a landslide. The Apollo 17 landing site also presented a new challenge. In order to land at Taurus Litra with the required lighting conditions, they would need to be in a specific orbit around the moon. And in order to get to that specific orbit, they need to leave Earth at a specific time. And that specific time in Florida happened to be at night. Apollo 17 would be the first and only night launch of the Saturn V. And for those keeping track at home, this would also be the final launch of a complete Saturn V, one that had all three stages. For the workers of the space program, this final moon landing must have been especially bittersweet. They had been called upon to do the impossible, and they had delivered beyond anyone's expectations. Even with the tragedy of Apollo 1 and the near tragedy of Apollo 13, their record was simply spectacular. But the Apollo program was a one-time deal, and even before Apollo 11 had landed, the program had started winding down. From a peak of something like 400,000 workers across America in 1965, by the time Apollo 17 flew in 1972, only around 100,000 remained at their jobs. Everyone from the assembly line worker to the upper echelons of NASA management felt the impact. Even Werner von Braun, whose forceful personality was so pivotal in popularizing the idea of human spaceflight, had moved on at this point. It's hard to estimate the impact of this kind of diaspora on an industry. Space is incredibly quantitative in that everything is driven by math and science, but it's also incredibly qualitative 
Not everything can be captured in books and computer software. So much of what makes rockets fly, satellites stay in orbit, and astronauts come home safely is locked in the heads of the people who make up the program. That institutional knowledge is impossible to capture completely. Just one example among many is the lunar module. While there would be a few more flights with Apollo hardware, as we'll soon discuss, Apollo 17 was it for the LEM. No more landings were planned, so no more landers were ordered. Everyone who worked on it would scatter to other projects and other companies or to retirement. We have all the schematics and all the source code, but that's not enough. The interstitial knowledge that bridges the gaps and makes the whole thing possible went home with those workers. We can never again build an Apollo lunar module. We can still build lunar landers, of course, but without that smooth transition to a new project and a new generation, much would have to be relearned that was once known. Not that it diminished the work ethic of this army of engineers. The workers of Grumman left a sign near this final lem saying, This may be our last, but it will be our best. When December 6th, 1972 arrived, the crew tried to view it not as an end, but as a culmination. While interest from the general public had faded, this last launch of a Saturn V carrying humans drew over half a million people to the region to watch. But as the scheduled time of 9.53 p.m. came and went, nothing happened. With a rocket as complicated as a Saturn V, everything has to be automated. The automatic sequencer was a system responsible for sending the right electrical signals at the right time to make sure the Saturn V was prepped and sent on its way perfectly. Well, today, for the first time, it missed a step. One of the S-4B's propellant tanks had not been pressurized for flight. Luckily, the whole system was smart enough to figure that out and stop the launch with 30 seconds on the clock. It took some time to come up with a solution, test it, and prove to management that it was safe, but in the end it was pretty simple, even if it also seems a little crazy. They used jumpers and banana clips to physically bypass the faulty step in the auto sequencer. I guess the engineers responsible had steady hands, because at 12.33 a.m. on December 7th, 1972, Apollo 17 lit up the sky. If you've never seen a night launch in person, it's difficult to describe what it's like. The cliché is, it's like the sun is rising in the middle of the night, but it really is like that. With a monster like the Saturn V, I can't imagine how spectacular it was. Sightings were reported from hundreds of miles away, but before long, it faded into a point of light in the far distance. On board the launch vehicle, everything was running smoothly. 11 minutes and 42 seconds after liftoff, the S-4B shut down. Command Module America and Lunar Module Challenger were in their low-Earth parking orbit. After the usual system checks, Houston gave the go for one last translunar injection. The single J-2 engine at the back of the S-4B burned for just shy of six minutes, and Cernan, Evans, and Schmidt were on their way to the moon. Their trajectory to the moon was a little unusual. Despite being more risk-averse than usual with the end of the Apollo program in sight, Apollo 17 was placed on a potentially dangerous path. Early in the program, the S-4B would place the spacecraft into a trajectory that, if left unchanged, would simply return to Earth, the so-called free return trajectory. Later, they got a little more daring and moved off of the free return trajectory to one that was more advantageous, but that could still be corrected with the small RCS thrusters or the lunar module's descent engine. But for this flight, there would be no recovery if the service propulsion system failed. The RCS would not be enough to get it back to a free return trajectory before encountering the moon, and the LEM's DPS would not be enough to get it back to Earth if the SPS didn't light behind the moon. The SPS simply had to work. Full stop. I guess the crew wasn't too worried about it, though. Even the two spaceflight newbies seemed relaxed for the trip out. In fact, at one point, Houston had to spend over an hour trying to wake them up after a rest period. Their sleep was so sound that they just slept through the radio calls. Houston was getting ready to play a loud, irritating tone over the air when the crew finally woke up, so clearly not a stressed-out trio. And with good cause, since 
When the time came for lunar orbit insertion, the SPS fired up and did its job with no issues at all. The last lunar landing mission had arrived in orbit around the moon. All that was left was to set it down. Next time. Well, next time we cover the end of an era. It seems like we are just getting started, but here we are. We'll talk about the final landing, and what Cernan and Schmidt did with their precious remaining time on the surface, and... Hey, wait, is that orange dirt over there? On the moon? We gotta check that out. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.